June 21, 2021, and basically said, as the nation's largest employer, we must have a whole of government approach. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is because I, in my role at OPM, I serve also as the government-wide chief diversity officer, managing and supervising OPM's role in executing and implementing uh, White House Executive Order 14035, uh, the DEI and A uh, in the Federal Workforce Executive Order. And I couldn't be more thrilled, especially at a time when we see DEI and A and belonging work um, coming under attack. President Biden and the administration have doubled down because we know as the nation's largest employer that we have great influence over how to build and become a model employer for all other employers. So we are excited. We are truly, uh, like I said, doubling down. And I support chief diversity officers across the nation, both obviously in the public sector, uh, in the federal government, but also have grown to become um, an amazing ally for those in local and state government in the private sector. So this is really an amazing time for me. But Natasha, uh, for your viewers, um, this road was not a straight road to get to this place, to become the nation's top CDO. Yeah, it, it really did become, um, or it started rather as a, if you don't mind me saying, as a high school biology teacher, teaching students a love of science. Yeah, no, I love that. If it's students for which didn't speak English as a first language, students with disabilities. And so that's where I began to understand inequity uh, STEM inequity, in particular STEM pipelines, and a lack of interest with regard to um, supporting all students. And so I labored and conducted research and wanted to try to reform teacher preparation so that we could, you know, affect our future and impact, you know, the the future of the workforce. And so these conversations that I started back in 94, 98, um, you know, are coming to fruition now. And so most recently I come from the Office of Governor in the Commonwealth or the state of Virginia, where I served as the United States' first cabinet level chief diversity officer to serve in a governor's cabinet. So if you will, for your listeners, a secretary level of DEI work. And I'm so excited to share with you that because of that work, uh, we did this in a bipartisan way. We supported the creation of that office in in across the nation, helped to set it up in six states. And now the One Virginia plan is being used in about 15 or 16 states. So really excited about being a part of a, a coalition, a movement mm, yeah. uh, to really stabilize DEI. And oh, it, literally, it's extraordinary. Um, I think you're extraordinary. Uh, the work that you're doing is not only impacting, immediately impacting in Virginia, but now where you sit, it's being impacted by millions, millions of people. How has your personal experiences impacted how you approach diversity and inclusion? You know, I'm someone who loves people. I, um, that's why I went into teaching and education because I genuinely love people. I love humans and I want to see us win. And so, you know, my personal experiences, I've always been a, a very outgoing person and yet somewhat of an introvert, if you will. Uh, so I understand this idea or this dichotomy of, you know, difference. I've always been viewed as a little bit different. Uh, whether it was in, you know, elementary school or high school, college. Um, but I never, I never sort of unwavered from this idea of human connection and relationship building, because I knew just instinctively, even as a teenager, that building relationships was how we get closer, you know, to that sense of belonging. I believe and a strive to um, epitomize the servant leadership model as I think about interacting with my teams, uh, 
my community, and my family. It's really about how do we meet our mission, meet our task, whatever that may be, how do we do it together? And so in terms of who I am, you know, as a human, I just love people. And so I bring that into the workplace. I bring that into my research. I bring that into my ways of knowing. And that's the reason why I I am so persuaded that diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility are the way we get to, you know, liberty and justice for all. This is how we get to uh, better organizations and institutions and improved sort of, you know, outcomes, especially as we talk about organizational health uh, in this post-COVID world. You know, everyone is scrambling, Natasha, about, you know, how do we return to the office? Everyone's Mm -hmm. scrambling about how do we do outreach to early career talent? How do we ensure that our workplaces or our employee experience is increased so that we can impact and increase our customer experience? Uh, Those kinds of conversations run right through and intersect squarely with diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And I think it's something that um, comes up time and time again in speaking with leaders like yourself that are leading the charge and doing this important work is that it's it's so important that we can weave DEI through the fabric of every part of an organisation. I know your office, most recently, the Chief Diversity Officers Executive Council was set up um less well actually I say less than a year it's just over a year now um just over a year ago September 2022 which is fantastic um so could you share with our our listeners some of the key achievements and initiatives that you've been able to to put in place during that time since setting up the council Natasha when anyone asks me to talk about the council I am the first one to run to that conversation because I'm so excited about it you know, as we get questions about sustainability and how do we support chief diversity officers and those who are passionate and those who are leveraging DEI and A, this is the answer. The Chief Diversity Officers Council, which you can see my logo right in my virtual screen right there, uh, is really set up as a part of and to support White House Executive Order on DEI and A, but really in terms of long-term sustainability. It's an interagency forum that uh, includes all of the top CDOs across government in our CFO Act agencies, as well as those from our partners with regard to the federal EEOC and the Office of Management and Budget and our White House colleagues. We come together and we begin to share promising practices and support CDOs. In the federal government, we have so many agencies, right? We have small, medium, and large size agencies that are making um, individualized decisions about hiring a chief diversity officer. How do we embed and leverage DEI and A principles so that we can get to better um, employee and customer experiences and organizational health and outcomes? And so with that, we have some CDOs who report directly to a cabinet secretary. Uh, We have some CDOs who report to an agency head or a sub-cabinet secretary or sub-cabinet agency, uh, like a director of an agency. That being said, we wanted to even the playing field. And so just standing up this council where we have the chair of the council serving as or is the OPM director. Kieran Ahuja, we have the two vice chairs on our leadership team of the council, which are the EEOC chair, Charlotte Burroughs, and deputy director for management of OMB, Jason Miller, and then myself serving as the government-wide chief diversity officer. And together, uh, we manage the council. And it is my great honor to be able to support CDOs across the landscape. We bring them together, we troubleshoot, we problem solve, and we innovate in real time. Mm -hmm. And one of the amazing accomplishments I'll just share, um, maybe one or two. Uh, First of all, please, listeners, go to and check out opm.gov and all the resources there. And there, in addition to, you will find information about 
the U.S. Chief Diversity Officers Council. And you will see um, our charter, our official charter. You will see um, an amazing video where um, I invite your listeners to meet a few of the CDOs from the council that I get the great honor to work with and support. And you will get to meet also our chair and our vice chair. So please do that. That's sort of my charge to the listeners. Yeah, no, no, because um, I've I've been on the website. It's it's fantastic. You you do definitely have access to a lot of information to learn more about what you guys are up to. And actually, I think um you recently what this year um published the annual report as well on on some of the data that you've you've gathered, which um in having a read through that is also very much eye opening as well. Yes. And so, you know, that brings up a great point. Together on the council, we've broken up into four working groups because this council is not just meant to be a check the box council where we sort of bring people together just to meet for the sake of meeting. We are solving problems. We are innovating in real time. And the creation of these four working groups, each working group has project deliverables and project plans. The, the names of the working groups include a standards working group, a policy working group, a um, data working group, and a training and development and partnerships working group. And together, these four groups are literally making headways, even amidst these headwinds of DEI and A work, um, sort of being in this complicated time in history, but together we're, we're, we're serving and working government wide, which is incredible. So we joined the likes of all the other federal councils, like the chief data officers council, like the chief financial officers council, the chief learning officers council, the chief, um, you know, information officers council. So now that we have created this brand new constituency of a workforce called chief diversity officers or chief diversity and inclusion officers or chief diversity officer or chief diversity officer uh, or equity officer positions, yeah. we have a place to come together um, equitably, just like all the other uh, uh, councils. And we are doing exactly what these other councils are doing. We're trying to meet the needs of our workforce. We're working very closely with our um, chief human capital officers councils. We're working very closely with our offices of general counsel so that we can get the work done. I mean, I think it's it just goes to show that even at the federal government level, you guys are understanding that collaboration, partnership is what's is what's going to work. And that is what's going to ensure that we can all come together and, and reach the the goals that we all, we all have. In in doing the work and in, in working with, with so many, um, sometimes you do get the phrase of, is there too many cooks in the kitchen? <laughs> can, can it be quite, it must be, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of diverse perspectives and um, in the room all in one time that all share the same common goal. So what have you found to be an effective ways or strategies um, in when you're setting out what you want to do, what's been the most effective approach that you've found so far? You know, you bring up a good point. So many cooks in the kitchen. I'll start by saying that the council is truly uh, the top CDOs at our CFO Act agencies. So think about the U.S. Department of Commerce, the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, the State Department, um, and to minimize all of those cooks in the kitchen. You know, I really have espoused with our CDOs a, a very clear communication channel so that we're not leaving CDOs out who are in subcomponent agencies, but it really is incumbent upon those top CDOs to allow that information and that innovation that we're doing and working through to flow down in their on their communication channel chains. So for example, what do I mean by this? The top CDO at um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is CDO Karen Comfort, amazing colleague and amazing um, innovator and friend. She sits on the council. And by the way, we just had a council meeting just yesterday, um, December 14th, and where we sort of celebrated um, having 15 months on the scene. But uh, she was there. But her CDOs 
at her subcomponent agencies, let's say at the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, there's a chief diversity officer there as well who is working on DEI and A and equity issues. And but that CDC CDO doesn't sit on the council. So it's really important that that information is free flowing Mm. across the government landscape. Now, my office also to mitigate this, we have what's called a DEI and A learning community where we bring together the entire landscape, whether you're on the council or you're not, whether you are a CDO or not, you could be a program manager, you could be a, you know, an assistant secretary, you could be a department head, you could be anyone in the federal government. But if you have a .gov uh, or .mil uh, email address, you get to come and, and join us for amazing speakers, my office hours, uh, webinars that we put on. And of course, we have an online uh, toolkit and space where people can come and, and watch if they could not attend live. Uh, maybe some uh, some of our online content. And so that is really intentional. That online community, that what we call the learning community, meets uh, several times during the month, uh, every other week or so. We have an amazing newsletter that, you know, corrals this huge community of practice. And when I say huge community of practice, Natasha, I'm saying upwards to, you know, 4,000 practitioners who wow. are in to That's attend fantastic. every other week. So there's energy. Mm-hmm. If I put out a message and say, hey, I want us to gather to talk about promising practices in DEINA, you know, that I get a lot of energy. I can have a thousand people to show up in about 24 hours that will come and log on. That's and beautiful. that speaks to the energy and the excitement of the work, as well as the call for support and um, collaboration. Mm, oh, that sounds amazing. And I I could only imagine the the excitement, the rumble, <laughs> the rumble, getting that email and being like, yes, I'm here, I'm ready, I want to sign up, I want to participate, I want to learn more. Um, it's 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 extraordinary. Flipping it on its head, what would you say has been the biggest challenge so far? Pick only one, Natasha. I know, I know there probably is quite a few, but <laughs> from from the from the time that you've that you've had so far, what's one of the standout challenges that you, that you think you faced? You know, the challenges of implementing DEI and A policies, and just by the way, in the federal government, we added the A to the DEI acronym. Uh, we have really elevated accessibility to cut across the D, the E, and the I. Uh, I would, I would say that our challenges are no different than the challenges you might find in private sector or philanthropy or academia. Yeah. Mm. This work is very, very difficult. And so you need to make sure that you are putting uh, and building offices that actually support the work, that this cannot be check the box work. And what we've seen in the last few years is a vulnerability in the excitement for DEI work. And it's sometimes tied to current events. And we don't want that to sort of be the case, right? We shouldn't be thinking about uh, hiring a chief diversity officer because of a particular current event, as tragic as those events are, because you don't hire a chief financial officer for a, an organization, a business, or an institution because of a current event, uh, because of a, a moment in time. Uh, I will tell you that you know I'm very passionate about balancing my checkbook, but no one's hiring me to be a CFO or budget analyst or any of those kinds of, you know, top financial kind of positions. Yeah. And so when we hear people say, you know, I want to be a a chief diversity officer or a VP or SVP of DEI, you know, just being passionate is in not in and of itself qualifying you to be in that role. And a lot of companies and institutions were hiring chief diversity officers, you know, so quickly because they may have raised their hand to say, I'll do it, or I'm the only one who's willing to do it. Or, you know, just, I, I happen to manage an employee resource group, so I'm qualified to do this work. Yeah. That really did more harm to this field that I love so much and have tried to usher in, you know, being the first 
a cabinet level chief diversity officer to sit in a governor's cabinet and help to create that in government everywhere and support CDOs everywhere. You know, I, I'm excited to see that, that the field is starting to right size, you know, yeah, that I of, of trying to place people who are very highly qualified, who know how to do this work that won't do harm to the work. That's, that's really some of the biggest challenges. And then linking that to data, making sure that this is not just a feel good position because as uh, leadership changes as um, attrition happens and leaders come and go, this work has to have staying power. And so for that reason, Natasha, um, I am so pleased to share with you that the federal government added a, a what we call a DEI and A index. Oh, and fantastic. it is not about just sort of saying, well, this is this just is the right thing to do. No, we've linked it to data and that's how we get to sustainability. So there are questions on our OPM uh, FEVs or Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey that ask questions related to the D, the E, the I, and the A to our entire federal workforce. This survey is the largest survey that goes to any workforce. About 1.6 million people are invited to participate. And what we did is created a baseline in 2022. And we found that 69% of our entire civilian federal workforce have positive perceptions of DEI and A as it relates to their specific work environments. That's huge. Yeah, I mean that and, that's a, it's a it's a massive that's a massive number of of people, and it, it then just goes to show like if you're if you've got four mil- millions of people that are saying no, we're happy, we we want this, we're we're for this then that's only going to show to other organizations outside that who employ the same smaller numbers or, or similar numbers that most likely your employees may well feel the same too. Well, Natasha, I'll take it a step further and say that it's not even, it's even more than, hey, I'm for this. The employees are saying to us, it's working for me. And it's in our data is showing it's working for um, and being reported by employees across all dimensions of diversity. It really is all of us. You know, I always say, and this is sort of one of my catchphrases, you can't change what you don't measure and you won't measure that which you don't acknowledge. And for the first time, the federal government is measuring and acknowledging the importance of DEI and A. So it's not just a nice thing to have. It really is about how do we improve our employee and customer experience. Well, Natasha, here's the fresh um, you know, news uh, flash is hot that off the presses, hot off the presses. <laughs> our 2023 FEVs data have come out, and in one year, we have been able to move our government wide DEIA index not one but two percentage points. And most statisticians will wow. tell you that it's nearly impossible. Yeah, so, man, like, waving flags and shouting from the roof and mountaintops about the work that we're doing because, you know, the attempts to sort of divide us using DEI and A and the attempts to weaponize this work, you know, the data shows that it's working for the largest employer in the United States. Uh, That's the message we need to get out. Mm. Two percentage points is Herculean. It is, it is almost um, impossible. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Like you, you absolutely smash it out of the park. Like, pat yourself on the back it's incredible and and this is the reason why I do this podcast and have this platform and speak to leaders like yourself because I want you to be able to share like this is what we've been able to do this is what's worked for us this is how we can get there and to troubleshoot and if if you are able to do it like I just feel like hopefully this will give encouragement to to anyone that's listening that may well feel like things aren't moving as quickly as they want them to Mm -hmm. consistency I think is key and to try and not let the naysayers and those that are trying to dampen what what we're what we're all trying to achieve to to win like you've just got to keep going keep persevering um but yeah congratulations like huge 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 congratulations to you and the team in the office thank you so much and i invite your um listeners and you and your teams to check out our opm um federal employee viewpoint survey uh public dashboard 
we are being also very transparent about our progress to say to all people, whether you're a naysayer or not, but especially those naysayers, take a look at our data, see where we're making the progress. Let the federal workforce tell you what they are seeing and saying. And um, it's a it's a great story to tell, and we need to do more of that. So, Natasha, I applaud you uh, for this podcast because a lot of times the naysayers get to tell their side of the story a lot louder than us who are in the work, doing the work, rolling up our proverbial sleeves, if you will. And we do need to get the word out about pockets of excellence so that we can just have a landscape of excellence. That's how we're going to get there. So I appreciate that. No, no, thank you. And like, um, I like how you touched on in terms of the transparency as well with the data, um, because I think it's just as important. So whilst we are celebrating the progress and um, that that's been made, it's also important that we're not only just showing the progress, like you're you're giving the full entire picture. Like this is everything that we are have right now. This is where we're at. This is where we want to go to. Um, so looking to the future, what changes or improvements would you like to see? Um, I have so many in my mind as we think about how to um, sort of codify this work. Uh, I'll first just say that one of the things that makes me happy and makes me hopeful is that the team that I get to lead at the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility, who is squarely every day supporting chief diversity officers across the nation, um, is a permanent career federal office. And so this work doesn't change with administrations. This work is, you know, um, work that we hope to continue on um, for years and years to come. So for that, I'm very hopeful. And I have, let me just give a shout out. I don't do this work alone. I have an amazing team. I can't do what I do or be on this podcast with you if it wasn't for them. And uh, that is true for all chief diversity officers. This is very, very difficult work. What I'd like to see in the future is that all chief diversity officers are fully funded, have resources, and this work is embedded across the agency mission or an institutional mission, as opposed to sort of being this a work like icing on cake where it's so easily to scrape off, uh, depending on how much icing you like on your cake. I really like to see this work being baked in, like the eggs and the oil and Mm. the sugar, the butter, the chocolate into the cake, right? I'm getting really hungry now. Yeah. (laughs) So when the cake comes out the oven, you don't see the original ingredients to the cake. You now see a beautiful, perhaps delicious um, result or outcome. And that's how we want to think about DEI and A work, that we enablers of a business. We are enablers of an institution or an agency, uh, as opposed to something nice to have that sits over um, in that corner office and we may or may not invite them to a meeting or we may or may not listen to what they have to say. That's what I'm hopeful for, uh, to really bake this into the equations of how we um, uh, come up with you know, budgets for agencies, how we think about our communications teams across agencies. How do we sync them up to tell the story? Um, I'd like to see historians really uh, chronicling this work. We're at an amazing inflection point, Natasha, as I know you know, as we think about um, this moment in time. How, How do we tell this story to generations to come? I think it's, it's, it's everything you said is true and I love I love the baking analogy I think it's it, it, it's it's so it just makes so much sense um and to link that back to to, to what you're doing it's, it's extraordinary and um before you leave us I mean I've enjoyed our conversation so much and I don't want to take up any more of your time even though I do secretly I'm like no please stay <laughs> I want to learn more um So just before you do go, could you give a parting piece of advice to all those leaders out there that are listening? What's one piece of advice that you'd like to give them? Again, I don't know that I can narrow it down to one thing, so I'll give you a couple of things. The first thing is check us out. Because if you go to our website, 
we have a ton of publicly available resources. You don't have to start the the journey alone. You know, whether you are CEO of an organization, whether you are a chief diversity officer or VP of strategic communications, you're on, you're doing, or you're thinking about DEI from a content perspective, you know, it really is about creating a, a coalition. I, I often call it a coalition of the committed, but you don't have to start this alone. A lot of people say, well, where do I start? How do I, you're asking me to boil the ocean or wipe up the ocean with a paper towel, right? We have done a lot of the work and have tried to strive as an exemplar for DEIA, not only the model, a model employer, but a model for DEINA. So for example, you can download right now our government-wide strategic plan for DEINA, a template that you can use to create a strategic plan for your institution. We published at, like you mentioned earlier, DEINA annual report, and all federal agencies have had to submit their DEINA plans. And many of those are publicly available as well. So if you want to see examples of how the U.S. State Department has uh, created and crafted their DEINA plan, it's available. If you want to see how the Department of Labor has crafted or Department of Commerce um, has crafted their DEINA plan, or even take a look at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. See how DEINA is woven into our overall strategic plan, as well as our diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility plan, and see how those two work together. There's another publicly available document called a Gender Identity Guidance Document, and we published that on March 31st, 2023. The reason I bring that up is that, you know, we we have entered into a space and time where there is an assault on um, gender identity, LGBTQ plus employees. But can I just share with all leaders, every one of us has a gender identity. Yeah. Right. And that document ensures that everyone can see themselves in that um, policy document. That is available for all of our uh, federal agencies, but it has become a model for even the private sector. I've heard from CEOs and chief diversity officers who have said, You know, we were waiting for you, the federal government, to put something out because now we can use it in our organization. And it is individualizable. It's not like a baked in, it's already done. But we give agencies and ask other institutions if they want to use it, please use it, but make it your own. Make sure that it makes sense for your agency. Um, But reach out to us if you need support. Uh, to and I say that to all of our federal agencies, we're here to help. We're here to be an ally. We're here to be a champion for you. We're, we provide technical assistance to all federal agencies in that way. But I also am excited to say that I link arms with chief diversity officers, even in the private sector. Don't do this alone. Don't feel like you have to be alone because our mental health, our sort of psychological safety as the ones who are going in to organizations um, trying to change systems and structures and sort of implement change management um, policies to get us to increased employee experience is hard work. We always sit at the, you know, intersection of either being um, sort of the most beloved or the most hated uh, folks in an organization because We are the ones pushing an organization to be better and think outside the box and maybe not just go with the status quo because we've all heard the line, well, we've never done it that way before, Mm. to which I reply, well, why haven't we thought about doing it a different way? So that's how you come up against inequity and sustained inequity so that we can, as I mentioned earlier, uh, reap the benefits of liberty and justice for all. Oh, Janice, that's amazing. Thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Uh, you you definitely have ri- risen my spirits. Um, I am so fortunate that you took the time out to speak with me and, and our listeners. I uh, will be linking down below all of that information and um, a link to OPM's website. So everyone's able to access all of those resources that you mentioned today and learn more about the work that you're doing. Um it's yeah it's it's phenomenal keep going and i'm so excited to see what's to come ahead 
Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you for having me. And let's not let this be a one and done. Let's have an ongoing conversation. A hundred percent. Definitely. All right. Take care. <laughs> take care.